Brothers Tony's sermon text will be on 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels, angels long to look. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that Brother Tony's sermon text will be very refreshing and that ears would be open, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And through experience that only the gospel, only the gospel of Jesus Christ will edify us. And, and the more it's about Jesus, the more it's about Jesus, the more edified we are, you see. And we've learned that. We've learned it through experience. We've, 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 we've come away with it, and we've come away without it. So we've learned what, what, we, what we need, you see. And that's why the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1.10 says, I will not be negligent to bring to your remembrance these things. Even though, even though you know them, even though you know them, and you are established in them. I'm going to bring them to your remembrance anyway. So that's what we do. We bring these things to us because this is where we're fed. You see, we don't, we don't get off on something else and we leave the saints essentially robbed of what they've come after. And you know, that's what happens when you don't. Now, <clears throat> I said, well, I, I want to, you know, in the, I'm going to go at the beginning on this. I, I didn't know if I wanted to or not, but I think, well, you know, in the beginning, God said, thou shalt surely die. That's what he said. Speaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he told Adam that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Then comes Jesus comes along thousands of years later, okay? And he said, I am that bread, that living bread that that came down from out of heaven, and if a man eat thereof, he'll live forever. He shall never die, he said. Death, both death and life are in the hands of God, you see. Uh, right there. Those who've been gifted by the Spirit to teach and to preach should, of course, preach and teach, right? Okay. But then again, we have this word from the apostle concerning them that seduce you. Ye need not that any man teach you, for the anointing teaches you all things. Now, spin it like you want to, but there's no teaching going on unless the teacher, capital T, is teaching, you see. Now, these are two examples, little examples. I, I want to illustrate how heavily guarded is God's purpose in salvation. He is guard. God is both the cause and effect. He is the action and the reaction, have you? God presents both the problem and the solution. And the Spirit of God, he says he's the author and the finisher, the beginning and the end. And what is man? What is man in all of this? Well, we are but dust. We are as the potter's clay, okay? Now, before God, all the nations of men are as nothing. That's what the scriptures say. So I want to look at, let's let that see the context by which we begin. I want to look at a couple of things in this text. One, of, one thing that you notice right off the bat is just a great affirmation about the gospel, loud and clear, speaking to us right here, telling us something otherwise we wouldn't know. Because, you know, if it was left up to the mechanisms of man, we would think, that it, salvation belonged to men, okay? <laughs> that we were in charge of it, that we could do what, we had the freedom to do what, what we wanted to with it. But we got into this text. This is not the case. Absolutely not the case at all, okay? We're not free to present God in any way we think it might be profitable or appropriate. Because number one, we see here that like everything else humanity needs, mankind needs, the gospel comes from heaven. Number two, that makes it then a divine message. It belongs to God. It's given to us. It's up to the saints then, brethren, to hold it and to defend it. Stop the encroachment of the flesh against it. That's our job, okay? My flesh, your flesh, his flesh, her flesh. It's our job, the saints, to stop that from encroachment on the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the people of God's got to make sure this happens. We can't depend on the preachers and the teachers and all them to do it. 
Okay? We got to do it. It's up to us, up to the saints of God. You know, because oftentimes, historically speaking, they've been the ones to lead off of distract, distracting errors. I'm sorry, but that's the way it's been. So, you know, you got to have the saints. They got to be alert. They got to know what's going on. And they got to say, hey, hey, brother, you know, and then that's why we stop it. Yeah. Now, because what we have, what the saints have been given comes down from out of heaven. And, you know, we sure ain't going to settle for no counterfeit. Okay? We ain't. Man, men go off, really. Men go off and they're looking for the great, the pearl of a great prize. And immediately, the devil hands them a counterfeit. They grab, they hold on to that all their lives, protect and defend it, you know, and then it come to find out on the final day it was a counterfeit, wasn't a real thing. You see? And that I'm afraid at the end of time, when it's all over, we're going to hear those same words again. But, but Satan beguiled me, you see. They were deceived. Now, in the first 12 cha uh, verses of this chapter, Peter actually is rejoicing in the salvation that's come to the saints of God. That's what he's, he, he's rejoicing in his salvation. He writes this letter and he does it. You know he's doing it to encourage the saints because that's the main things the saints need to hear. They need to be encouraged. Number one, capital E, they need to be encouraged, okay, because the saints are highly vulnerable to discouragement. It's a sensitive nature of the kingdom of God, and the saints have it in them that can be discouraged. So the best thing you can do for your brethren is encourage them, okay? Now, this is, uh, now, I encourage, I, he wants to encourage the saints. And you notice that only the born again can be encouraged. If you're talking to somebody and you know that you're being encouraged and they're not encouraged, well, you know, then uh, there's, there's a reason why they're not being encouraged. It's just like water rolling off a duck's back. The, I'm going to tell you something. The saints, those who belong to God, when you're talking about Jesus, the source of encouragement, you just encourage them. Okay, now in the uh, in conclusion, I want to bring quick attention to the 13th verse uh, where he concludes this uh, 12 verses with an exhortation. And so he says, therefore, or wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what, it was, what a perspective to have, you see. Matter of fact, that's supposed to be our perspective. It's the whole work of God at the end. That's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for a full redemption. We're hoping for a full salvation. When Christ returns, that's going to take place. Rejoice in the salvation that comes to the saints of God. Be sober and hope to the end at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the way we're supposed to see it. Salvation has come unto you. They've come unto me. And while it's true that the world has, a whole world, actually, you know this, has been delivered from Satan. Now, you know that Jesus has done this. Men can get up and walk out, you see. Now, he has delivered the whole world. That's true. However, it's the, it's the remnant, <laughs> remnant, it's the remnant that belongs to God. They're the ones he has redeemed. And salvation has come specifically to the household of God in, the, in those terms as well. Now, this is why in the very first verse, Peter addresses these le this letter to the saints. He's talking to the saints, you see. In other places, this word for strangers and translated pilgrims and sojourners, and as he uses in verse 1, and sojourners of the dispers uh, dispersion or the strangers scattered abroad. He's talking about the saints who have been scattered abroad. Verse 2, the elect of God, not just strangers and sojourners, but they, these are the elect of God that's been scattered all over the place and abroad. Now, it's been done to us. I, I want to go over this really quick, and, and then we'll really start moving along. Uh, it's been done according to his foreknowledge, brethren. Okay? Now, God only does what agrees with his eternal purpose, you see. That's been determined. It's not by chance or happenstance that we're scattered abroad. It's not something Satan done for crying out loud. He can't do that. This is the kingdom of God according to his foreknowledge. So then everything is perfectly joined together according to his will. It's clear to us that all the people of God are scattered abroad. So Peter's talking to us today. This is just as pertinent. This is just as relevant today as it was then because we're the dispersion. Scattered across the earth. It applies to all of us all through these ages. 
Now, that was the 13th verse. The 12th verse is our uh, text. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because our sister read it to us. But I'm going to narrow in on one phrase. That's the phrase uh, that I've already made reference to. And that's the one, them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which the angels desire to look into. Now, uh, this is the salvation of, of, of which the prophets had inquired and searched diligently and who had prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, this message of good news concerning Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this message about the one who came down from the Father and ascended back to glory after that he was resurrected from the grave. This message that he brought to earth, where did it come from? You see, where did this message originate, actually? Huh? We're talking about the whole doctrine of the Lord, the whole thing. What he taught the disciples and the, later became the apostles and what the apostles taught. Where did it come from? Sometimes you just got really, you just got to really stop sometimes and just ask. Just everybody to hold up a minute. Now what you're saying, what you just said, where does that come from? Where did you get that at? You know, because let me tell you, Peter tells us it came down from heaven. The Holy Spirit brought this. It makes this a divine message. It's actually a good idea for, me, for those who are listening to ask, now what this person is saying, what are you saying here? It, it might be a little bit different. You've you got to ask, where does this come from? That's a pretty important thing to ask. Since we have Peter saying the message of heaven that came down from heaven, that the message God intended for mankind is a divine message. Amen. And Peter is the first one who can say where it comes from because you know, as you know, Peter was the first one to give the to give that message, he preached it. Now, if someone says my message comes from heaven, then believe me, we should be able to trace it back to there. Wouldn't you think? Amen. There should be some kind of testimony, right? I'm, I'm for one, I'm looking for a divine testimony. I'm looking for a divine message. See, so we ought to be able to trace that back uh, to, uh, to a testimony, a, a one that comes from heaven. The point is, it was given to Peter, this this word was given to Peter and it became his testimony. We can trace it back. 50 days after Jesus resurrected the glory, after the Holy Spirit done the work of gathering up all the people, then, uh, then the apostles, their, their mouths was lit with power, okay, as the Holy Spirit came from heaven and, he, and gave them that gospel message, you see, and he preached it. It came with power from God. Pre Peter said the Holy Spirit that comes from heaven and when he came, he came with power and the power of God. And just like Sister Ada said, he is, stay, he is here to stay. And where is he at? He's in the heart of the saints, okay, as a testimony of what God has done. Now, we know all the disciples. Disciples knew this themselves. They didn't have any power until the Spirit came. They didn't have any power. They're tucked away behind a, 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 a closed, perhaps locked door. They didn't have nothing. But when the Holy Spirit came, he came with the power of God, and he came with a message. He gave them something to say. And that's how their power, that's the testimony, what they said. In order to reach the hearts of man, the same thing is true today. Okay? We depend on the power of God to accompany what we preach. In order to reach the hearts of men, God's got to be involved. The Holy Spirit has got to be there. Now that's, and he was, he's, He's got to be able to use what you say. And, and for this reason, he's willing to give you what to say. Let me tell you, now if you get up and you've got your own message, count the Holy Spirit out. Simple as that. He won't be there. He'll find some other place or something. As you read the account, it's easy to see from what Peter preached. When it comes to salvation, from the salvation of the message, it, it's from heaven. It's, it's, there's only one man, okay, Jesus Christ. Now, we're here, we're here to say it one more time. When it comes to the salvation that comes from heaven, there's but one message. There's only one. And, you know, men, they got to hurry and figure this out because time is running out, you see. We, can't, I, we don't have on and on and on and on. Paul told the Galatians, there's not another gospel. There's not one. 
And he said, when men get up and they preach that other gospel, they trouble the people. You've been troubled by another word, what's in the gospel. It don't benefit you at all. It actually troubles you. We're talking about the God's message centered in his son. The one the Holy Spirit brought to the apostles. Now, here's something we can definitely agree on this morning. The Holy Spirit will not work in any place where the main person we're preaching is not our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just specifically, okay, what Jesus has done to reconcile the world to the Father. Okay, it's about him and the Father, you see. And then there's other things that fall up underneath that. But don't expect the Holy Spirit to convict the guilty sinner if you're preaching about yourself, okay? If you're putting yourself on display or any other thing. And we know all about the flesh, don't we? I, I'm talking about our flesh, the one we got to tote around till it's over with. We got to put it under. Now, it's a shame when men get up to impress other men when actually what they should be doing is impressing on the hearts of men Jesus Christ Amen. and what Jesus Christ is Do you want to impress something? Impress that on people. Exhorting men to do whatever they got to do to get what's in between them and God out of the way. Amen. Preachers should, I want to be honest with you, preachers should just forget about all those things that they think are important. Okay? Unless it's about Jesus Christ. Okay, but if it ain't about him, okay, just forget it and leave it at home. The job has given the preacher to do, anybody who gets up here, it's to stay on topic. What's that topic? Our topic is Jesus Christ crucified according to the Apostle Paul. I don't want to know anything else but Christ and him crucified. I'm not up here for any other. I, I couldn't tell you anything great exploit I've done that would benefit you, get you to heaven. It won't even get me to heaven. Any, any great thing I've done won't get you or anybody else down. It'd be a waste of time to get up here and talk about some kind of great something I've done. Okay? Because in reality, I mean, the truth is, there's only one great thing that was ever done, period. Okay? It took place on a cross. And that's the only thing we can't talk too much about. Now, it's by the way of the cross, incidentally, that we get the glory. Thy cross is lifted over us, and we journey in its light. Lead on, lead on, O King Eternal. Peter said the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Let me tell you something. That just as soon as Jesus left this earth and sent it back to glory, guess what he done? He sent the Holy Spirit. Just like that. I guarantee you, it was like he handed off the baton on a relay run. Jesus came in across the finish line. He passed the baton to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was off running. Right straight. Well, we know this. We ain't got to guess about it because the Lord told us as much. I'll send him, Jesus said. Now, when he was preparing to leave this world, he gathered all the disciples together, and he had that, he had that, uh, that great chapter, John 16, and he was telling them he was preparing to leave and go back to heaven. That's what's fixing to happen. And his words about him departing and leaving had filled the hearts of the apostles with so much sorrow, it just near about shut them down. So much sorrow, Jesus had to tell them, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that I go. It's a good thing for you that I go. This is how I read. But, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me <laughs> whether thou goest. But because I said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Their, their hearts were so heavy, uh, it's like they just sucked sucked the words right I didn't know what to say but nevertheless I tell you the truth it's expedient for you that I go away for if I do not go away the Holy, the comfort will not come unto, unto you but if I depart I will send him unto you I will send him unto you now Jesus has already told them this these same kind of things he's been talking about this uh, quite a bit but they hadn't read. he told them I'll, I won't leave you comfortless I'll come to you and I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comfort that he may abide with you forever. Verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Then chapter 15, one more. But when the comfort is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth will proceed from the Father, he shall testify of me. Yeah, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness 
because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, Jesus says that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, I'll send him, and when he's come, he will testify of me. And he's going to teach you, open up everything to you, because you're going to testify too. Now, because uh, remember, Jesus said, ye shall all testify of me. Now, the world needs a testimony. That they need, the world needs a testimony. That's how the world's going to be saved, brother, with a testimony. They don't need some, any other thing. Okay, they need that. We all need a testimony of God, from God. We continue to need a testimony. It's not an earthly testimony, you know, in that sense. It's, it's, it's one that comes from the Spirit, a spiritual testimony. So then when we see the Holy Spirit coming, we see him coming in behalf of Jesus. Not for, him, not for himself, but for Jesus. He comes to bear witness and give testimony and to confirm and to demonstrate by evidence that Jesus is who he said he is. We look at the message that we've been given that has been sent to earth. The message. Huh? Doesn't the gospel do that, doesn't it? The gospel, it, it's a testimony. It confirms Jesus Christ. It makes a man look. You preach the gospel, and it makes a man look at Jesus. It does. He's got to look at Jesus. And he's got to, he's got to do something. This is what the gospel is designed to do, to give evidence. And it becomes the evidence in those who receive by faith. God has come, and he's defeated the devil and taken away our sins. The gospel bears witness to this. It gives a testimony. It testifies to it. It shows forth in the record. It shows forth in the record. God has he, he's kept a record about it. God's got a record, we sing. He's kept a record about this. It's his record. It's primarily made, primarily made up of testimony. Testimony after testimony. God gives testimony. He testifies. God does this. And this kind of language is found, out, found through all out the scriptures. I listened to the men preach this morning, almost invariably, every one of the men used the word testimony and testifies and, and testified over and over. Brother Matt used it over a, on, on nearly, uh, I think I, can, I stopped at six. All the brethren used it at least once or twice. It's, it's a hub by which everything we speak is. It's, it, God is presented to us in this manner through testimony. The revelation of himself is lived out in the men. In the lives of men, historically, the Apostle John, you know, now he, he speaks most particularly in this fashion in his writings. John is just mostly concerned with the testimony. You'll see, he becomes, this really his specialty, you know, is to is pick up this testimony and, and, and hold it up before you and, and show you by testimony. Yeah. Now he closes out his gospel account this way. This is the, this is the disciple which testifies of these things. That was important to Apostle John. Pick up on the testimony. I'm here to testify. And he wrote these things. And we know his testimony is true. He testified these things. And his testimony is true. You hear how many times through This is the Apostle John's unique perspective that he gives us. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, labor this just a little bit. Maybe I can make a point of it. Uh, you're, you are uh, familiar with this opening in Revelation. He writes, Who bear record? of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of things that he saw. He's talking about John then. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. I, John, who also am your brother and companion tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. For the word of God is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The witness of Jesus from heaven and of his brethren. You know, that's been the business of God all along. You look back and see it. He's been developing this testimony and this record. There are three that bear witness on the earth. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, Revelation 19.10. You know, I, John, fell at his feet. It was an angel. And to worship him, he said, huh. He said, see thou, do it not. I am thy fellow, fellow servant and of thy brethren and have the testimony of Jesus. This is the angel speaking. Uh, we carry the testimony. The angel's carrying this testimony of Jesus in himself. We are carrying this testimony of Jesus in ourselves. Worship God, the angel says. 
for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John the Baptist couldn't do anything else. We talked about this, me and someone did this morning. John the Baptist, he's a, he's a premier example. He couldn't do anything else. I mean, he had a right to boast of some things. John the Baptist, but he refused to do it. You won't see John the Baptist highlighting himself, okay? You read the record, you, John considered himself just with all the other disciples, you see. He refused, okay? John the Baptist couldn't do anything but give testimony to cry. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. That's all I am. May strike the way of the Lord. Then came for a witness. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He wasn't the light, you see. He understood that. He was, he was sent to bear witness of that light. John bear witness of him. I'm reading scripture. John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I spake he that cometh unto me is preferred before me, for he was before me. The testimony of John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. Jesus said, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Why was John the Baptist so great? His testimony was of, of, of someone who was greater. We got this testimony. John, Jesus says, God is my witness. And I give testimony to him. Well, you know, it was Jesus that said, I have a greater witness. He's speaking of John the Baptist. I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me, and the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. So I can do, in, I can do nothing on my own authority as I hear I judge. And my judgment is just because I, his judgment is just because I seek not my own, but the will of him who sent me. I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. My point is the testimony he was giving. Seven times Jesus says, "What I speak comes from the Father." There's multiple verses that you are familiar with them as I am. The Lord's doctrine is exactly the Father's doctrine. Whether it be of God or not, Jesus said. Jesus is in essence saying, it's got to be of God. Okay. If, whether it be of God or, or not, our work has got to be what God is doing. Our speech has got to be what God is doing. It's got to be in agreement with his testimony. What we have received, his spirit is going to make sure this gets done. God has spoken. He has spoken and he has testified you know, Peter recalls God speaking out from out of, on, on the holy mount. He never could get it out of his mind how God spoke on the holy mountain down to them. There was a, that, that was, it had to be a, not a trump. That was a, a, that was a big thing, in other words. And he recalls this. This is my beloved and son in whom I am well pleased. Hear, him, hear ye him. This is, God's, this is what God is, uh, is saying. Hear ye, I hear this. What do we hear? This is what I hear. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights in whom is no variable neither shadow of turning of his own will he begot us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature this word of truth of course in its truest sense is Jesus Christ now God speaks from